Over the past year, Astra has been working like crazy to try and get our rocket Karma ready to launch. So far, all the parts of our rocket have been fully tested. We've tested all the systems of our rocket with a whole battery of pressure testing, two propulsion testing campaigns, which culminated in our final full duration burn of 10 seconds. We've also performed a bunch of tests with our recovery system, including deployment tests in a wind tunnel, separation tests, and finally a test where we actually threw the entire system outside of a plane and watched it drop for 600 meters. But at this point, there's not much left to test and we just got to put it all together and hopefully get a launch. As you may know, if you've been following the channel, Karma was slated to launch at Euroc 2023, which is a student rocketry competition that's hosted every year in Portugal. Before we get into what happened at Euroc, we first might want to look at what exactly Karma looks like right now. Starting from the top and moving downwards, we first have the nose cone. The nose cone primarily consists of two parts, the first of which is the nose tip, which if you remember from our previous videos, we actually cast out of aluminum. The rest of the body of the nose cone is wound out of fiberglass and then insulated with cork. Karma is actually designed to separate this nose cone at Apogee so that the nose piece will actually fall all by itself and the body of the rocket will also fall by itself separately. So two bodies are going to fall once the rocket reaches Apogee. And to make this happen, we have our separation system. It performs this separation by rotating some gears and triggering a spring mechanism to actually shoot that nose cone away. And you can find out more about that system in our dedicated video that we did on the separation system. The primary avionics for the vehicle is contained within the nose cone, along with the recovery system that's specifically for the nose cone. This is what houses our flight computer and all of the mechanisms that we need in order to trigger the parachute deployments and bring that nose cone back safely. For our space shot rocket, this is actually the only part that would be returning to the Earth and being recovered. The body would just fall to the ground without a recovery system. But because Karma is a smaller vehicle uh, and Yurok requires that you recover all parts of your, of your vehicle, we're actually also recovering the body too. So there's also a bigger recovery system that's actually on the body half of the vehicle, uh, which functions very similarly to how the nose cone recovery system works. Uh, just with bigger parachutes. The whole recovery system is then integrated onto the top of the tank via our hard point, which we actually wound into the tank as we manufactured it. This allows us to actually have a spot on the rocket which we can drill into without actually drilling into the tank itself. If you ever want to integrate parts with CFRP wound structures, this is actually a really good method because you don't have to compromise the carbon fiber structure by drilling holes and instead you can actually drill holes into something that you've actually wound into the tank itself. The oxidizer tank of Karma is designed to contain nitrous oxide, which is the oxidizer which Karma will be running on, and it holds that nitrous oxide inside the tank at 60 bar. To get this kind of performance, we just took a regular steel tank, which was rated to 15 bar, and then wrapped it over with carbon fiber to make it so that it could withstand 60 bar at a safety factor of 3. This tank actually has a lot of safety features on it as well. It has both a pressure relief valve and a purge valve, which helps us to relieve pressure if we ever need to do that in the case of an emergency, or actually just to kind of help our filling process along. We also have an exhaust valve at the bottom of the tank, which allows us to exhaust all of the liquid out of the tank really quickly in the case of an emergency. Also at the bottom of the tank, we have a filling valve, which of course allows us to fill the tank with nitrous oxide. And then of course we have the main valve, which goes into the combustion chamber. In order to integrate the tank with the combustion chamber, we actually use these four aluminum spars, which span the distance between the tank and the combustion chamber. At the tank side, they were just siliconed onto the body of the tank, and at the combustion chamber side, they were actually bolted to the middle bulkhead. We also had a middle bulkhead fairing, which wrapped around this space, which was mostly contained by the valves and the hydraulics, which is designed to help the flow of the aerodynamics around the vehicle and not through our valve system. And finally, if you've checked out any of our hot fire testing videos, you probably know what's at the bottom of the rocket. It's of course our propulsion system. It's a bit too complicated to get into the specifics of each part of the propulsion system, but if you want to know more about it, you can definitely check out some of our videos that we've already done on the topics. Altogether, Karma stands at about three meters tall with a diameter of 250 millimeters. And she also comes in at a whopping 92 kilograms wet mass. Damn! But the real question is, can she get off the ground? Arriving in Portugal was super exciting because, after all, 
This is what we've all been waiting for. We've been working all year, designing, building, and testing all the parts of our rocket, and it was all just to get to your rock. But as we started to unload the trailer, we started to realize that, well, we might not be the most professional group here. It was hard to miss the professionality that some of the other groups were bringing and the sophistication of the systems that they had. And after having a good walk around on the first day, we started to question a lot of our design choices. And in those questions, we started to realize the problems. One of the first problems that was almost visually striking was that our fins were not quite the right size. Now we had done some modeling before in order to properly size our fins for the aerodynamic situation that it's going to be in on the launch rail and then taking off and maintaining stability throughout flight. But unfortunately, it turns out that modeling that we did was probably wrong. It's false. It's totally made up, pure fiction. We were working with a new software package in Python called RocketPy, where we actually confirmed the size of our fins and that we would be stable with those fins. But unfortunately, we had some bad input that we put into that program, and it obviously gave us the wrong answer. And it was only after looking at some of the other designs that we realized, hmm, maybe we should kind of check that math. So on day one, we had an immediate problem. Our fins are not big enough. But this wasn't the only problem we noticed. We also recognized that our rocket was actually the biggest one of the competition. While this may seem pretty cool at first, when you consider that Karma is not the most powerful rocket at this competition, uh, a slight concern starts arising. And that's with thrust to weight. After all the modifications that we had to make during our last propulsion testing campaign in order to get the system to work, we ended up adding a lot of mass. At this point, our thrust to weight ratio was hovering around 3. And this meant that we didn't actually have enough takeoff velocity to maintain stable flight and use the Yurok rail, which is obviously a pretty big problem. But lucky for us, there was actually a really professional group of the competition called VAR. They come out of Munich in Germany, and they actually brought their own rail, and it was a giant. So actually, kind of perfect for Karma. And that's another cool thing about the Yurok competition, which is that although it is a competition, uh, most people there are happy to work together just to hopefully see another rocket launch. However, with the switch of rails, we actually had a problem because the rail buttons that we had for our rocket were actually designed for the Yurok rail. And so now we had to actually make a whole new set of rail buttons in order to use VAR's rail. In addition to these major structural issues with the rocket, we also had some electronics issues as well. Although we had built all the electronics for our testing activities, like throwing the nose cone out of a plane and testing the propulsion system on the test stand, we didn't actually have a lot of time to integrate all of those pieces into a avionics system on the rocket. So a lot of that work was actually being done as we got to Portugal. This meant that we actually ended up doing a lot of soldering and wiring and configuration of those electronics onto the rocket while we were actually there. Are you sure this isn't a test? The next big hurdle for Karma was to pass the flight readiness review, which is the review that comes right before you're actually allowed to launch at Yurok. Now, provided that the flight readiness team is happy with you being able to launch, then of course, you will then be able to go to the launch site and launch your rocket. But without this clearance, unfortunately, you're grounded. So this was Karma's next challenge, to pass the flight readiness review. Considering how far behind Karma was in the whole integration process, we decided to postpone that flight readiness review to as late as possible, which was all the way to day four. That gave us 48 hours to figure out how to solve all of our problems. Meanwhile, Tackling the first problem of the fins was relatively straightforward. I mean, all we had to do was design, buy, cut, build, and then integrate some new fins in just 48 hours. I mean, how hard can that be? You've lost your mind. You've lost your goddamn mind. Lucky for us, there was a metal supplier in Portugal who had a sheet of aluminum that was three millimeters thick. And of course, we quickly jumped on that opportunity. Once we had our new fins cut out, it was just a matter of attaching them to the rocket. And for this, we used our trusty friend, Silicon. Considering the size of these fins and the forces that they'll be subjected to, this may be a bit of a questionable choice at first, but according to our calculations, it should be strong enough to keep them on during the flight. And just to be extra safe, we do actually put one bolt through the main middle clamp that's holding those fins on, just to make sure that even if the silicon does fail, the bolt should still hold the fins on. The next problem was the issue of the rail buttons. This is a bit more tricky because those rail buttons need to be manufactured very precisely. The rail button needs to have a very smooth fit with the rail, otherwise you could run into an issue where the button actually jams in the rail and then your rocket is stuck.
But of course, it's a little bit of an issue because we don't really have precision tools like lathes or mills that are just available to us in Portugal. Or did we? It turns out that our friends at VAR actually thought of everything. They had a big giant truck which they used to actually move their rail and the rocket, and it had lots of space, so they thought, why not just bring all our tools? <laughs> right, yeah, of course. And one of those tools happened to be a lathe, so they actually let us use that lathe to manufacture some new rail buttons. Yeah, so basically the VAR team was really saving our butts in a lot of cases. Then it was just a matter of welding those new buttons onto the old button locations. And then boom! our rocket was ready to be integrated. But of course, you can't just trust that all of your new changes just work magically. So we had to make sure that those buttons actually slid properly into the rail and that our rocket was actually able to hold its weight on those rail buttons. So with our hard work over the past couple of days, we did our final integration test to see if we were able to actually hang on to the rail. Let go, let go, let go. So with that positive step, we moved on to the last problem, which was of course the integration of the electronics. Time was running out and we really didn't have a lot of great ways of integrating our electronics onto the rocket. So in the end, we actually ended up relying a lot on silicon. The night before the flight readiness review, the judges came by and had a look at what we were doing. And they mentioned some things that made us, again, question the legitimacy of our reliance on silicon. They noticed, of course, that the structural spars, which were integrating our combustion chamber with the tank, were actually connected to the tank only with silicon. Considering that this is a critical load-bearing interface, they were very concerned that we hadn't really understood the maximum forces that that bond could withstand. So we decided to try to address this problem by doing a little bit of a test to prove how strong silicon really was. So we designed this little experiment where we had two plates which were silicon together. One of them had a little circle in the middle of it, which allowed you to put weight onto the bottom plate in order to pull the plates apart. And then we just progressively put more weight on until essentially the bond failed. And in doing this little experiment, we actually discovered that that little bond of those two aluminum pieces was actually able to withstand over 500 newtons of force. If we scale up the bonding force to an area of a meter squared, this means that this silicon actually has enough force to withstand 50 tons per meter squared. So armed with that new knowledge, we thought, hey, this has got to go well, right? We now have the proof that our integration design is actually okay with all the silicon. After finally integrating our entire system on day four, we were finally ready for the flight readiness review we invited the judges over and we started to explain about how all of our system was put together. And of course the judges were immediately skeptical about a lot of the ways that we've integrated our rocket. After looking at the four aluminum spars which were integrated to our tank via silicon, they didn't really think it had the structural rigidity in order to withstand the forces of launch. Although we had an experiment to prove a little bit the strength of the silicon, they still remained unconvinced that this was a proper integration technique and they were pretty sure that our rocket would probably fall apart in the case that it were to launch. They were also deeply concerned about the way that we had integrated our electronics onto the rocket because many of the components would probably break if they were exposed to high aerodynamic or structural loads and the consequences of losing those electronics pieces was probably not going to be positive for the flight of Karma. So in the end, Karma unfortunately did not pass the flight readiness review. This definitely dampened the mood for the team a little bit because 
After all, we had worked so hard this year to try to make this happen, and it was just really sad that we didn't actually get to launch. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. But regardless, this was a huge learning opportunity for the team. We realized a lot of the issues that we had with our design by seeing a lot of what the other groups are doing and watching them launch and also work through problems of their own. We were able to build a lot of really successful systems on the rocket, but unfortunately, we just didn't have enough time and we didn't focus enough on the actual integration of all those components. So in the future, we're definitely going to spend a lot more time on making sure that the integration of our parts is correct and the systems are working together in order to create a successful overall system. And I think this is a really important growth opportunity for the team at Astra that will probably influence how we structure our projects in the future. And I can also promise you that this is not the end of Karma. Karma will launch, just not in 2023. We hope that by sharing this story, you may have learned a couple of things and hopefully learned from our mistakes. And if this gave you a little bit of value, be sure to hit that like button. Of course, if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below. And remember to expand your horizons.